the industry. Now, before COVID-19 set, set in, our oil and gas sector was facing serious challenges, relating particularly around climate change concerns and also getting its products to market, both domestically and internationally, with delays or cancellations of pipeline projects. Then along came the COVID epidemic, which has disrupted our daily lives and hurt our economy. Now, perhaps that is a, could be looked on as a blessing in disguise, since it is forcing us even more to consider deeply where Canada should go in managing its abundant energy sector. Now, we have an excellent panel together of speakers with pan-Canadian experience in energy. We are particularly honoured to have with us Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, the Honourable Seamus O'Regan. Now, the format is quite simple. I will ask each of the panellists to make introductory remarks of up to five minutes, and uh, then we will go to a roundtable discussion. The Minister will speak last and uh, will respond to the thoughts presented as well as giving his own insights into where we're going in the natural resource sector in Canada. So that's the, that's the uh, plan. Our first speaker will be Martha Hall Finley. Martha was recently appointed the Chief Sustainability Officer at Suncor Energy after serving for a number of years as the President and CEO of the Canada West Foundation. A lawyer by profession, Martha worked as a legal counsel and then as a senior executive in companies in the telecom sector in both Canada and in Europe. She also has the distinction of having served for two terms as a member of parliament for riding just north of Toronto. Martha certainly brings to our panel today a trans-Canadian viewpoint to our topic. Over to you, Martha. Well, that's great. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, thanks so much, Ian and Gowlings, for hosting this. Um, uh, and thanks for the invitation to be a part of it. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, there's no question COVID has, has been dramatic for everybody, but it has been particularly challenging from an economic perspective for the oil industry, not just because of the dramatic reduction in demand for oil and oil products, oil related products like gasoline and jet fuel, um, but also because some of your listeners may remember right at the beginning, there was a little bit of a, of a spat between the Saudis and the Russians on, uh, on supply. And so we faced a double whammy of, of dramatically reduced demand and dramatically uh, dramatic oversupply to the point where we almost almost got to uh, to storage um, uh, capacity being full. Um, but more importantly, I think now is is that COVID has provided I'm I I hope in a positive way a really important reminder of how interconnected the environment and our social and economic systems are. And indeed, you know, one of the things that I've been seeing is is a, a reminder of what sustainability really means. In the, in the last number of years, we've really come to focus on sustainability as being almost synonymous with greenhouse gas emissions. And there's no question climate change is a huge problem. We, we get that. But you know, I, I, go, I go back to the United Nations, you know, the, the, the heart in some ways of, of the sustainability discussion and sustainable development goals. Um, the UN 2030 sustainability agenda actually refers to itself as, and the agenda as a focus on people, planet, and prosperity, the three Ps. And, and the prosperity piece is something that COVID has really, really hit. This has been devastating for people who've lost their jobs, who've lost their ability to provide for their families, who... Um, uh, of course, people who've gotten sick and the many people have died. Um, the, the, the economic consequences have been really, really stark and, and will continue. Um, and, and energy is key to prosperity. We see that around the world. Energy is a key element to bringing people out of poverty, which is you know, a, big, a big part of, of the sustainability development goals. Um, 
in, indeed, when you talk about energy and prosperity, it's even more stark when you see the number of people around the world who don't have access to affordable and easily accessible energy of any kind. Um, so we know that demand will come back. We're already seeing it start to come back. Demand for easily accessible and affordable oil will continue. That may not make everybody happy, but there's no question, you know, 30 years ago, the mix of, of energy used in the world was 80% um, uh, fossil fuels. The mix today, well, before COVID happened, um, it's still 80% fossil fuels. That's including the dramatic increase in renewables, you know, the fact that renewables are becoming so much uh, less expensive. All of that speaks to the fact that oil continues to be affordable and readily accessible for so many demands, including agriculture, including all sorts of manufacturing, including all sorts of services that we, that we, we come to rely on, health, education, in so many ways, um, that simply can't stop tomorrow. And, and in fact, COVID in that ironic way has shown that we can't just stop it. We can't just stop producing the stuff because the consequence would be in effect what we've seen COVID happen, a dramatic reduction in economic activity with all of those really you know, very difficult consequences for so many people and, and their families. So as we look forward, key is transforming is not to deny the fact that that's that's the reality we have today. The key is transforming the world's mix of energy demand combined with transforming the, the nature of the energy that we are able to supply all to lower or, or no carbon options. And, you know, I'm really excited. I've only been in Suncor for a few months. Yes, it has been an interesting introduction. Um, but, but convinced I, the only reason I joined the company was the, the firm belief that there, that Suncor and, and indeed the energy industry, the oil industry has to be um, a huge part of the solution. And, you know, COVID-19 has, has highlighted, if anything for us, that we can't do that alone. We can do investments, we can transform our energy supply mix, but fundamentally COVID has really shown that the solutions lie in collaboration. So it'll be, and Minister Regan, it's not lost to me that you're on the panel. The, um, the importance of, of business, of society, of governments, all working and collaborating together to, to address these really serious problems while recognizing the realities of the energy demand that we need and that the globe needs today. So looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, David. Thank you very much, Martha. Uh, our next speaker is Gary Marr, who interestingly enough is Martha's successor as the president and CEO of the Canada West Foundation, a position which he just assumed in April. Now, prior to joining the foundation, Gary served as the president and CEO of the Petroleum Association, Petroleum Services Association of Canada. Like Martha, Gary has experience in elected office. He was a member of the Alberta Legislative Assembly for some 14 years. And during that time, he held a number of cabinet portfolios, including health, environment, and international and intergovernmental relations. Over to you, Gary. Thanks, David, and thanks to Gowling for putting together this webinar. I feel very fortunate to be uh, involved in a panel of such distinguished Canadians. Um, you know, my, I'm going to start by talking about COVID in the broadest sense. Uh, some commentators have talked about how COVID-19 has really changed the course of history, but I actually want to suggest that instead COVID-19 has accelerated the course of history. And if you look at some of the things that have changed, they were already trends that were in place. The, the rise of e-commerce, uh, the digitization of the economy, how we work, where we work, people working from home, how we delivered education, uh, how we deliver healthcare. But one of the transitions that uh, it has accelerated is the International Energy Agency projected last fall that the demand for oil might go from 100 million barrels of oil a day to 70 million barrels of oil a day you know, over the, by the year 2050. But that transition didn't happen in a span of three decades. It happened in a span of three weeks. And uh, as Martha correctly pointed out, some of that demand is coming back up as the economies uh, start to open up again, particularly in China. Um, you'll see, uh, you know, recent reports uh, coming out of the Canadian Embassy that Chinese demand for oil is back to about 90% of what it was 
uh, in the pre-COVID period, uh, Jim Burkhart from, uh, from um, uh, IHS Market has uh, made the same comments and been quoted the same way. And, and let me say this about, uh, and just picking up on some of what Martha was talking about, there was a time 30 years ago, you know, when I first started following public policy, when the policy silos of energy and economic development and the environment were really three different areas of public policy. And today, more than ever, if you were thinking about it in terms of a Venn diagram, those silos now overlap each other. And uh, you cannot look at one area of, of public policy without considering the other two areas. So we know that you cannot have um, economic development without affordable, reliable energy. You cannot develop any kind of energy, uh, including renewables, without having some impact on the environment. And so uh, energy development and economic development and the environment are all inextricably linked together. And it's finding the public policy um, where these three areas overlap that'll be really, really important uh, for us to come to. One of the important lessons uh, from uh, uh, from COVID-19 is that demand has gone down, uh, but when we track what has happened with GHG emissions, uh, they have not gone down in a way that would come even close uh, to meeting our Paris uh, uh, targets for GHG emissions. And so what it yields uh, is the conclusion that um, we could never tolerate the sacrifices that would be necessary to eliminating uh, the use of, uh, of fossil fuels uh, to the kinds of levels that would be required to meet our Paris targets. And what it suggests is that we really need to be thinking hard about what the public policy looks like in terms of uh, being able to come out uh, into some form of recovery. And I've certainly heard uh, both uh, Minister O'Regan as well as the Prime Minister and, and Minister Morneau uh, talk about uh, how what we have in public policy will determine uh, the kind of recovery that we have. And so uh, I'd like to propose that, you know, uh, because, um, you know, we, the pandemic has yielded that we can't simply get to our Paris targets uh, by eliminating the use of uh, fossil fuels, uh, we need to think about transitions. We need to think about natural gas as being essential, that it'll help reduce uh, reliance upon uh, more heavy emitting uh, sources of uh, energy. We need to look at nuclear power as a serious option. And yes, renewables have their benefits, but they are not a magic bullet either. I mean, uh, their advantages have to be weighed against their own um, environmental impact. Uh, clean hydro, for example, does result in the damming of rivers, uh, which has its own uh, ecological impact. So uh, I'm uh, looking forward to this panel. I, I want to say that uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Minister O'Regan and he's got, uh, uh, he's, he's got a lot of ideas that I've heard him talk about recently uh, that suggest that we can go in the right direction in terms of public policy that will yield a, a great outcome for Canada. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate that, Gary. Uh, our next speaker will be Marty Proctor, who is the president and CEO of Seven Nations Energy. Prior to joining Seven Nations in 2014, Marty served as COO of Baytex Energy. Earlier in his career, he worked with production exploration companies in Canada, the United States, Kazakhstan, Russia, China, and Norway. Must have had a lot of travel points, going to all those spots. But Marty brings to our panel a wealth of energy experience, both domestically and internationally. Over to you, Marty. Thank you, David. It's an honor to participate on this panel with all of these distinguished guests. Our company name, Seven Generations Energy, is an ecological concept which originated with the great law of the Iroquois and states that it's appropriate to consider the impacts of a decision made today on the seventh generation into the future. Next slide, please. Seven Generations was founded with the guiding principle, we exist to serve the needs of our stakeholders. 
which include governments who are the elected representatives of the owners of the resource, communities where we work, including indigenous communities, suppliers and service providers, employees, and our capital providers. We recognize that our stakeholders care about environment, social, and governance, or ESG, greenhouse gas emissions, job creation, and strong financial performance. To be successful, we must serve all stakeholders well. Next slide, please. Seven Generations Energy is a specialized and focused Montney resource developer. The Montney is a huge hydrocarbon resource that straddles Northeast, Northeast British Columbia and Northwest Alberta. It's estimated to contain about 90 billion barrels equivalent of marketable resources. 7G has leased about 800 sections or about 500,000 acres of Montney rights, about 100 kilometers south of Grand Prairie, where the natural gas is rich with ethane, propane, butane, and condensate. We have invested about $10 billion over the last six years to drill, complete, process, and transport liquids-rich Montney natural gas. Our production grew from less than 8,000 barrels equivalent in 2013 to about 200,000 barrels equivalent in 2018. We've paid about half a billion dollars in royalties, which support healthcare, education, and infrastructure. We provide a direct employment to, up to 1,000 to 1,500 contractors and employees at our work sites and indirectly employed about 5,000 people, including workers that manufacture pipe in Sault Ste. Marie, workers that manufacture compressor skids in central Alberta, railway workers, and so on. Our rapid growth was facilitated by stakeholder support, including the capital provided by first private equity about 10 years ago, and later by public markets beginning in 2014. 7G has worked hard to minimize our environmental footprint and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We have one of the lowest carbon intensities in the energy business. 7G and other Canadian companies are committed to develop Canada's resources responsibly, and we are open and transparent about our work. We think Canadians should embrace the opportunity to obtain the hydrocarbons they need from the most responsible developers in the world, which happens to be Canadian energy developers. 7G is, a, is proud of a natural gas supply agreement, which we recently executed with Energier the largest gas distributor in Quebec. Energier's customers want responsibly developed gas for their domestic and commercial needs. So 7G collaborated with Equitable Origin and the Pembina Institute and welcomed their thorough audit and review of our ESG performance and the way we work with our stakeholders. 7G became the first North American energy company to earn Equitable Origin's EO100 Responsible Developer Certification, which facilitated the gas supply agreement with Energier to bridge Canada with Alberta gas supplied to consumers in Quebec. I think this natural gas supply agreement can serve as the model for the future of Canadian energy. We need pipelines that bridge Canada, delivering responsibly developed energy from the provinces with the resources to the consumers that need the resources. This will ensure that Canadians have energy security while supporting the Canadian economy. And this same approach should be considered for delivering Canada's abundant resources to the world. Canadian oil and LNG can reduce global energy poverty and redu reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. Canada is a nation that is rich with natural resources. Historically, we've been proud to deliver our resources to the world while strengthening our Canadian economy. Together, we can develop a Team Canada approach that balances energy, environment, and economics. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, Marty. Um, our next speaker will be Al Reed. Al is the Executive Vice President, Stakeholder Engagement, Safety, Legal, and General Counsel of Synovus Energy. Al has more than 20 years experience in the oil and gas industry. He started his career as a regulatory lawyer. In 1999, he joined Synovus's predecessor company, and over the years has had developmental and operational management roles in the company's oil sands projects. Alan, over to you. Thanks, David. And, and uh, thanks very much to Gowling uh, for hosting today and for everyone for being online. Um, really excited to be here and, and be part of the discussion today because we think it's a very timely and important topic. Um, I, I put a, just a couple of slides in. Um, and uh, the first one just talks a little bit about Synovus for people that don't know us. 
Um, we don't participate in the retail space. So we're primarily known as an oil sands company. Um, we produce uh, in the, in the uh, Athabasca oil sands, we uh, uh, are a SAG-D producer. Um, and, uh, but we also have um, conventional oil and natural gas production in Western Alberta and Northeastern BC, as you can see on the map. In addition, uh, we also have uh, we also have a 50% ownership, non-operated ownership, in two U.S. refineries, um, and own a crude by rail loading facility in Bruderheim, Alberta, which, as you can see on the map, is just east of Edmonton. Um, we have seven billion barrels of oil equivalent of reserves on our books. Um, we have always been focused on sustainable sustainability and sustainable production is core to what we do. I'd like to take a minute to just go to the next slide and talk a little bit about our sustainability. Um, and so as a company, we've always been focused on sustainability because of the size of the resource that we have and, and its focused nature in the oil sands and, and in the deep basin. Um, but last year, we really took the time to do a materiality assessment and ask ourselves, what are the most important things that we should be focused on from from an ESG perspective. And, and what we did with that was we identified the four areas you see on the screen. Um, and we set targets for each of those. And each of these targets um, are things that we'll achieve between now and 2030. And I won't go through each of them in detail, but I did want to touch on a couple of them. So the first one is that we'll reduce our GHG emissions intensity by a further 30%. Um, and hold absolute emissions flat between 2019 and 2020. That's on top of the 30% emissions intensity reduction that we've already achieved over the last 15 years, um, which is a, a very important indicator of, of how you're performing in the GHG space. The other thing you'll see on the screen is that we have an ambition to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And, and the reason that we have a target for 2030 is because we know how we'll do that. We have the technology and, and an understanding of what that will look like. But the 2050 ambition, and this is something I'll come back to in my talk, is because it will rely on technologies that aren't today widely commercial. So uh, that's an important thing that we always highlight with this. The other one that we thought was really, really important to highlight is, is that we have a history of doing business with Indigenous companies. Um, since we started uh, as a company in 2009, um, a long string of predecessors before that, but as we started in 2009, we spent about $3 billion with Indigenous businesses in and around our operating areas, and we're committed to spend an additional 1.5 over the next 10 years. Um, and that's a really part, important part of economic reconciliation and involving local people in the opportunities that are available. Um, the other thing that we announced in January was something a little different as well. Um, one of the things that we've known for years is that the housing situation in Indigenous communities um, in Canada is, is not something that we can all be proud of. Um, and we, we saw it firsthand in the Indigenous communities near where we operate. So we also have announced a major initiative to spend $50 million over the next five years to build much needed new homes in six First Nations and Métis communities uh, in and around our operating areas. Um, uh, just to try and improve that situation as well. As you can see, we've also set targets with, uh, for reclaiming wells uh, and as well as uh, caribou habitat restoration and uh, freshwater intensity target that is aimed to keep us uh, industry leading in terms of our freshwater use as we produce oil and gas. Um, I think uh, where, where I start is uh, that uh, many of you will already know that that, uh, Canada, that the energy sector is Canada's largest contributor to GDP. Um, and for many years, I, I don't know that we'll be able to say that this year, it was the largest private uh, sector capital investor in the country. Um, so now more than ever, our country needs a strong and prosperous energy sector to help lead a post-pandemic economic recovery. And certainly, I think everyone's starting to recognize that, that the economy is going to need a lot of work as we go forward. And just as the energy sector was able to lead the recovery after the 2008-2009 difficulties, we think it can do that again. Uh, to facilitate that, Canada needs to implement policies that encourage investment in Canadian oil and gas operations um, while positioning our industry 
to be an integral part of a transition to a lower carbon future. There's some positive ways the government is already doing that. Certainly the, the, uh, the programs that have been rolled out by the federal government in terms of helping with methane emission reductions and, and dealing with some of the orphan well situations that have developed because of poor econ economics um, in some parts of, of our business uh, are, important, are important to getting people back to work and starting the economy going again, particularly in Alberta and Saskatchewan. But governments also have a very important role to play in the development of technology to, to deal with environmental challenges. Um, and that's no, probably most uh, stark in the area of GHG emissions. Um, and this can be done through funding partnerships, uh, as well as uh, introducing policies that, policies that encourage not only technology development, but technology commercialization, while also ensuring the competitiveness of our industry uh, globally. And being competitive is a key concern for uh, participants in our industry. The development commercialization of emissions reduction technologies and particularly carbon capture technologies are expensive. And it poses a significant barrier to Canadian companies when the vast majority of international oil producers don't operate in an area that has a carbon, that has, in a jurisdiction that has a carbon tax. Um, and they don't have to add those to the uh, cost of abating car CO2 emissions uh, to uh, the cost of their operations. That's not something that we complain about, but that is something that we think we need to make sure that we make it economic for oil and gas production to continue in Canada. Government and industry can work together to help us remain competitive um, and maximize the global value of our oil and gas products, all while we reduce GHG emissions. And, and this is where I think government support is vital for Canada is to move ahead of the rest of the, of the world and maintain its position as the, the most responsible producer of oil and natural gas in the world. Um, we would support two key policy recommendations that will help us do that. The first one is, is that uh, for Canada to adopt, and this is where I go back to the 2050 ambition of net zero emissions because the technology is not there today. Really key to that is carbon capture utilization and storage. Um, in the US, they have, they have developed something called a 45Q tax credit that can creates an economic incentive that, uh, for uh, the, the capture and sequestration of CO2. Um, and we think that's a key part to Canada participate for Canadian oil and gas to continue to develop as we uh, move forward with a, a cleaner economy. Um, and secondly, um, there's an opportunity and certainly um, when it comes to infrastructure, um, we, need to, uh, we need to be looking at, uh, can government participate in something like expansion of the Alberta carbon trunk line um, into, the, uh, into the oil sands area? So certainly the timing for policy that further supports innovation in the Canadian oil and gas industry has never been better. Canada has a tremendous opportunity to have the energy industry lead uh, the recovery uh, of the economy right now. We have the world's third largest reserves. We're the fourth largest oil producing jurisdiction, um, which presents an incredible opportunity. And we believe that there's going to, as oil production increases, that it really should come from Canada. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Al. Um, we now head back across Canada to the east for our next speaker. Uh, James Cognac is the Executive Vice President, Corporate Affairs and Operational Services at Bruce Power, which operates the largest nuclear plant in the world on the beautiful shores of Lake Ontario. Lake Huron, pardon me. Um, over his years with Bruce Power, James has focused on environmental and waste management, Indigenous and community relations, and corporate social responsibility. Outside of Bruce Power, James is the Vice Chair of the Independent Electricity System Operators Stakeholder Advisory Committee. James. Great. Well, well thanks very much, David. And, and uh, yeah, you didn't want to get this, get it wrong. Lake Ontario is beautiful, but it doesn't even compare to, to, to Lake Huron. So, you know, I always like to say Bruce County is one of the most beautiful places in Canada eight months of the year. 
and, and maybe the minister has a similar comment uh, in the province he's from, but, uh, I, but I won't preempt him. Uh, look, I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this today. And, and you know, I, I know we're short on time. And there's really, I, I think, three, three or four key items from a, from a Bruce Power uh, Central Canadian perspective that, that I really want to share with people today. The, the first is, you know, I mean, it goes without saying we're in unprecedented times and, and we all recognized how much COVID, how quickly it, it, it really hit us and how dramatic the impacts were on you know, our society, on, on our organizations, and, and, and really our, you know, frankly, our, our confidence and our, uh, and, and our view of the, of the future. And, you know, before I, I, I sort of get into the, the sort of the energy sector piece, I mean, I'm an eternal optimist by nature. And, um, you know, and I think that one of the unique opportunities that COVID has presented uh, to us, and, and we're still not through COVID yet, we have a long way to go, but it's a, it's a tremendous example that I think we will look back at decades later and say, you know, we were able to, to tackle COVID-19 in a way that we came together and we did very amazing things. Uh, and especially if you look at how Canada's responded, the provinces responded, and many businesses have responded, communities, healthcare, you know, we have a lot to be proud of. And I think the reason why that ties in with the energy sector is we've been stuck in the mud for a long time in terms of this debate around the environment and the economy. And it has, uh, uh, you know, been a, a, you know, which side wins and which side loses. And, and frankly, I think what that has done is led to a lot of instability uh, for projects. It's, it's led to, you know, a lack of investment. And frankly, I think the, the net result of that has been bad economic outcomes and also bad environmental outcomes. So, so you know, neither quote side has, has won, so to speak. So, you know, fundamentally, you know, there's going to be a lot of conversation on, on recovery. You know, I think we can all agree that the, the Canada's economic recovery is going to involve energy, it's going to involve infrastructure, and it has to involve innovation. From a Bruce Power perspective, maybe I'll just kind of share with you how COVID hit us. As David mentioned, we're the, the world's largest operating nuclear facility. So, you know, there's, there's an expectation that we are providing electricity to Ontario families and businesses. We generate about a third of the province's electricity. Um, and, um, you know, that wasn't the case 20 years ago. We, uh, 20 years ago when Bruce Power was formed, we were providing about 15% of uh, Ontario's electricity. And we have, you know, returned uh, aged assets to service. We've been able to optimize our units and now we're generating over 30% of Ontario's electricity. And really what that has meant is, is that we contributed to about 70% of the energy needed to phase out coal in Ontario. So, you know, it's great that you have a lot of these countries around the world saying, talking a real good game on climate change. If you want to look at, you know, uh, one weekend during the COVID-19 pandemic, Ontario was the most decarbonized electricity system in the world. Uh, and that was enabled through the phase out of coal, uh, the increase of nuclear, the increase of hydro, the appropriate use of natural gas, uh, and the uh, introduction of, uh, of, of renewables. And you can debate how successful different pieces were, but at the end of the day, the results uh, speak for themselves. We are off coal in Ontario. You know, and, and I really think that's where innovation comes in. You know, our, um, you know, we always used to have a saying in nuclear power that we were a baseload electricity provider. And we always used to say the elephant can't dance. That was the old uh, terminology of our previous CEO, Duncan Hawthorne. And when the Ontario government decided to, to move down the coal phase out route, um, you know, we challenged our team to say, what innovation can we do to get the elephant up on its tippy toes and dance? And now, 10 years later, we provide one third of our output flexible, and it's, it's as flexible as coal ever was. So, you know, it goes to show you that innovation can, uh, uh, can work. The other key innovation is, and this is really outside of energy, but we've been able to do work in our asset to produce medical isotopes. Uh, you know, during the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we shipped enough cobalt-60, we're the world's largest supplier of cobalt-60 from the Bruce site, to sterilize 13 billion pairs of medical gloves. And so as we think of strategic supply chains and we think of the role of the energy sector, you know, you know we need to look at the energy sector as, a, as an intellectual horsepower, a technological horsepower, that if it's, if it's healthy and its supply chain is healthy, we can use it for other things. And I mean, isotopes in the nuclear business is a real good example where, you know, we're very uh, strongly positioned on that. I do want to um, uh, save some time for questions, but in terms, of, in terms of policy recommendations, 
you know, Minister, I know, I know you'll be speaking next and everybody's filling up your to-do list with, with, with takeaway items. You know, we, we as Canada's largest private sector infrastructure project, you know, we're not looking for, for government funding. We, we have great investors in Omer's infrastructure, our unions and TC Energy. But what I do think is a priority is how do we strengthen our supply chains? How do we strengthen our, our supply chains and our networks? And I look at nuclear as an advanced manufacturing supply chain. And, you know, I think we have real opportunities looking forward with or, uh, organizations like the Canada Infrastructure Bank that were set up to deal with projects that would not be economically viable pre-COVID pre and saying, how do we use those existing policy tools to strengthen and enhance projects, uh, supply chains from projects that were viable so those supply chains are equipped to do other things. Um, and also, you know, we can have a healthy debate about carbon taxes, but at the end of the day, we have a carbon tax in, in Canada. You know, and I, I believe the core, the, 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 the easiest way to reduce emissions still remains through our electricity sector, a decarbonized electricity sector that can be leveraged for other things. And I think we need to recognize there's an extra cost that goes into decarbonizing. Uh, and that whether that means new infrastructure, new technologies. And I really think we need to have an honest debate in this country about not whether or not we should have a carbon tax. I think that has really been decided. It's really about, you know, how could we redirect carbon tax revenues to electricity consumers so we can continue to ensure that provincial jurisdictions are investing in clean electricity infrastructure, which is an absolute enabler to everything else. You know, I mean, we can have a debate about you know, how, how much is needed on the oil sands. Um, but, you know, we've proven here in Ontario that phasing out coal is your best bang for your buck. And if we can make that a, a national priority, as I think we had, and be open to all the technologies needed to do that, you know, I really think we've moved the ball up the field. And I really think in an environment like this, that's, uh, that's as good as it gets. And we got to be practical. And as we like to say, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So David, I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, James. Well, now we're going to head further east from the shores of Lake Huron to Newfoundland. And we're joined now by our special guest panelist, the Honorable Seamus O'Regan, Canada's Minister of Natural Resources. A native of Newfoundland, the minister became well known coast to coast as the co host of Canada AM, where he no. came into our, into our uh, kitchens and our dining rooms for breakfast for over 10 years. He was first elected to the Canadian Parliament in 2015 and was re-elected in the 2019 federal election. He was appointed to cabinet in 2017 as the Minister of Veterans Affairs and then was made the Minister of Indigenous Services in early 2019. Following last year's federal general election, the Prime Minister appointed the Minister, as the Minister of Natural Resources. Welcome, Minister. Thank you, David. Uh, much appreciated. From to the shores of the North Atlantic. Not to be mistaken for Lake Huron or Lake Ontario, I can guarantee you. Uh, <laughs> President of ExxonMobil Canada reminds me that this, our offshore jurisdiction here, is the harshest environment in which he works in, in the world. Uh, it's, it's a tough spot to extract oil. We managed to do it. Um, uh, I want to commend all the other speakers. I want to commend Gowling on, on this opportunity. I will try my best to keep it to time because I want to, I want to keep uh, as much time open for questions as possible. Um, I, I would, I'd, I'd go back to uh, uh, an experience that actually Martha and I shared. We both attended two events in two days uh, back in, I think, early February. Uh, one being uh, GLOBE, which is the biggest clean tech conference in, in North America. It takes place in Vancouver every year. And um, I gave a speech there in, in which, uh, amongst other things, um, my real point was to reiterate um, that, our, first of all, our government has committed to net zero emissions by 2050. But, and I should just mention, actually, I just got word uh, that the uh, government of Newfoundland and Labrador, the, their legislature here, have just passed unanimously a commitment to net zero here. And as an oil producing province in this country, that's a bit of, that's big news. Um, but, but what I said was, there is no getting to net zero in Canada uh, without our oil producing regions. There's no getting to net zero without Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland and Labrador. There's no getting around it. You can game it out whatever way you want. Uh, we all have to be on board for this. 
And the next day, we went to Calgary for an innovation summit, and it was a smaller audience, but the table, uh, you had, you know, Martha was there, uh, some of the biggest players in, in energy uh, R&D in, in the country, uh, for oil and gas particularly. And, you know, when I, in speaking to them, it was clear at that point how, how investment in, in, in oil and gas, Canadian oil and gas, was changing. That's, it's huge to mention that, I mean, because it, it's something that was in play before COVID hit. Um, uh, you know, what Mark Kearney had been saying was, was happening. And, uh, you know, this is before Norge, uh, Norway, who, you know, an oil competitor of ours, most particularly Newfoundland, uh, you know, they, their sovereign funds pulled out investments. Uh, and Sweden's the same, but BlackRock and a num another number of other big players. And, you know, as somebody once said to me, follow the money. Um, you know, investment dollars were moving and moving in a different direction. And, and as, as, as had been put to me, we did not want, and we do not want Canadian oil and gas to be the box to check. And by that, I mean, you don't want people who are making investment decisions to ask, you know, their analysts and people who, you know, whether they're in Zurich or London or New York, uh, what are we doing about climate change? And have somebody say, well, we're just, we're not, we're not investing in Canadian oil and gas and have that as the box to check. That's what we have to avoid. Um, and one of the, if you look on the other side of the ledger, what I said then was, what is increasingly becoming the box to check on the other side of the ledger, a marker that a jurisdiction is taking uh, climate change seriously, lowering emissions seriously, uh, is net zero. Um, so while it's 2050, and while, you know, some people are cynical about it, it's the moonshot, you know, it's, you, 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 you say you're going to go to the moon, and then you figure out how to get there. Um, but there's something psychologically to doing this. There's something psychologically uh, to, you know, the legislature here just moments ago doing that here in Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, the other thing I always mention in my speeches too, and I do with a great deal of pride, is that Canada is the fourth largest producer of oil in the world. And with some audiences, you really have to let that sit with them because it's not a way that we identify ourselves. Certainly not the way that, we, that other countries who produce less oil than us and export less oil than us identify themselves, who see it as a strategic imperative, a strategic national imperative. We don't to the same extent, but we got to think that way. We have to, because not only do I say it out of pride, because I think it's remarkable what we've done in Alberta and Saskatchewan and what we've done in the harshest climate that Exxon Hopal operates in off of Newfoundland, um, but if there's a responsibility to it. So that if we do want to lower our emissions, which most Canadians do, and we do want to become a leader in this, and the world is watching us, then we have to take this very seriously. And we can't dodge it. We have, to, we have to tackle it head on. I'm reminded of that every time I attend an international energy agency meeting, um, as I have repeatedly, you know, from my den. You know, I used to be able to fly to some very lovely places that my predecessors did. I have not had that, uh, I've not enjoyed that luxury. Um, but you know, Canada's always asked to speak in the first round. And, and I think what I can say here too amongst this group is we also make the first page on the Zoom call of hundreds of people, right? So there's a hierarchy in Zoom. We're always on the first page, I recognize that. It's because we're the fourth largest producer of oil in the world. You know, that's, that's why we're there. And when I'm asked to speak, it's, it's because that's what I represent. And the world is watching us and they recognize us as being the fourth largest producer of oil in the world. They also recognize us as the second largest hydroelectric producer in the world. They recognize us as a tier one energy, nuclear energy producer. They recognize us uh, for, for, you know, our social, our social, our solar, our wind capacity, our storage capacity. So, you know, I would just say that as, as we move forward, you know, there's going to be tectonic shifts because the thing about net zero, the key word there is net. Non-renewables will be a part of this. Uh, it is a matter of, of the mix that we enjoy in this country between uh, renewables and non-renewables. Um, we, we have to commit ourselves, I think, to a few things um, go, as, as we move forward. We have to make sure that as we, as we come up with a plan for net zero as a country, that it's a smart plan. Um, you know, that we demonstrate the ingenuity that we've shown off the shores of Newfoundland and, and as we've shown in Alberta and Saskatchewan and our ability to extract oil and to do it well. Um, we have to be thorough in how we, we, we're going to go about net zero because there's all sorts of answers that are sometimes obvious and sometimes not and, and things that kind of incrementally accumulate. Uh, one of the best things we could do is retrofit houses and retrofit government buildings. The amount of energy saved by doing that is absolutely remarkable. 
And we have to be very thoughtful about how we go through this transition. I know this as a, as a, as a resident and a citizen of an oil producing province in this country, we cannot leave regions behind. We cannot leave workers behind or their families. Uh, and, and much uh, praise to Ian Allen and his initiatives with, uh, with, uh, with indigenous groups. We cannot leave indigenous people behind. So we have to, we have to go forward together. Jim Prentice, uh, I've been reading, I have his book on my desk uh, all the time, actually. He was a friend, um, his book, Triple Crown, which I recommend is a very thoughtful read on Triple Crown being uh, indigenous environment and, and, and oil and gas. And, you know, Jim says and reminds us, there's no other democracy in the world that has the bounty of natural resources that we do. No other democracy. So, you know, it's important that we bring everybody along. We do our best to bring a critical mass of Canadians along on this. Uh, because we don't, if, if the change is too much, and if they don't buy in, in a democracy, they will elect somebody who, who won't, who won't make those changes, who won't achieve net zero. And perhaps I would argue, not achieve the prosperity for industry that we need, not provide them with that stability and that clear direction. Um, there, there is an urgency now, I would, I would say, uh, in these past few weeks over COVID, but, but looking at Black Lives Matter and, and any of you who have children, uh, who have uh, of, of teenage years and in their 20s going home and speaking to them in the evening. I can tell you my cabinet colleagues are and after a long hard day coming home and being challenged on these issues. Um, Canadians are going to be demanding prosperity, but I think a more equitable and shared prosperity and how we square that with climate change and net zero. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's part of my mandate letter. <laughs> it's something that we're all going to have to do together. That is our national mission. That, 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 is, that, is our, that is our national mission right now. So thank you, David. Well, thank you very much, Minister. Um, you have uh, beautifully um, summarized the challenges our country is facing, but also how important energy is to this country and, and, and the whole sweep of energy from oil and gas to nuclear, to our renewable capabilities and so on. And I think that's what this panel has also done. Um, first, let me see if there are questions. I, I could start asking questions. I've got a lot of them, but I, I think what I would better do is if everyone could turn on their video uh, so the minister might be able to see who else is on here. And uh, what we could then do is any questions for the minister or, or comments about what has gone on already? Uh, anybody want to raise anything particular? Uh, David? Yes, know? Martha. I would, uh, I would love to chime in. Um, I, I just a kudos to the minister because there's no question um, messaging from, from government has been interesting over the last few years and it's just incredibly welcome to hear. You know, the, the, my last comment was if, if anything COVID has shown is the importance of collaboration between governments and business and society and it's just wonderful to hear um, uh, Minister O'Regan speak in that vein and, and, and act in that vein. And so there's just a big thank you for that. Um, but I, I, you know, Suncor is, is Canada's largest integrated company, uh, energy company. I mean, we operate, you know, I'm incredibly proud of our electric highway where you can drive across our Petro Canada stations. You can drive across the country with uh, over 50 stations where you can charge with them no more than 250 kilometers apart. You know, we can drive an electric vehicle coast to coast what that does is that that actually allows people to get over their range anxiety when they're wanting to buy electric vehicles. And so right up there with getting off of coal is getting people out of their old clunker cars, um, especially the old ones, even the newer ones are, are, are uh, gas combustion ones are much better. So if we can actually encourage that kind of behavior, that's a, that's a fantastic thing. Mm -hmm. But but there, the elephant theme I wrote down, and now I love James's comment about the elephant gannets, because the elephant in the room is that for all of this stuff, we emit an awful lot of greenhouse gases, and we particularly do in the oil sands. And we're just not, <clears throat> we're just not going to solve that problem tomorrow or next mm -hmm. week. And, and so, you know, I then turn to, yeah, if you, you look at greenhouse gas emissions, the oil sands are a really big part of that problem. We are therefore a really big part of the solution. And I love the, the comment that the elephant can dance because there's a much greater recognition that those of us engaged in that activity 
the ability to invest in some of these next two new technologies, for example, is key to actually getting that dance to happen. And so I just, I just wanted to say a thank you to the minister, thank you to my colleagues for, for all of this. Um, it's a really, really big challenge and we need to make sure that we address it head on. Thank you, Martha. Other comments? Let me throw out an idea to you. Um, just to, uh, James talked about nuclear and mm -hmm. um, there has been over the years some discussion of using small modular nuclear plants um, in the oil sands and elsewhere in the oil and gas sector. I mean, nuclear energy basically doesn't go west of Ontario effectively. I mean, we, have, we mine nuclear, uh, we mine rain and pardon me, in Saskatchewan, but we don't have any nuclear power west of Ontario. And the question is, can the elephant dance in Alberta? I, I mean, I just throw that one out. I mean, is there a possibility that as the new nuclear technologies come on stream, that it, it could be a part of this whole answer? Well, maybe I'll chime in and, and, and James, you may want to speak to it. Although uh, I think James knows, I mean, I, I spoke fairly uh, emphatically about this at the Canadian Nuclear uh, Association's uh, AGM. Uh, we've gained it out and there's no way we'll achieve net zero without nuclear. Um, and and I, you know, I, I made that speech uh, very deliberately just to see what kind of reaction it would get. It obviously got a very good reaction from those involved in the nuclear industry. It, it, uh, it got a very, um, it, the, the, the response in terms of a critical response was very muted. I think Canadians understand now, you know, the importance in, of the nuclear industry and, and uh, critically, I think in Ontario that it, it doesn't emit, you know, and the SMR models that we're looking at, uh, one of the key things is that uh, it actually recycles, reuses nuclear waste. Um, so small modular reactors for people who don't know are just very, are highly mobile, um, much smaller nuclear reactors uh, that have all sorts of, of, of good uses. I mean, we'll probably begin the first SMRs on brownfield sites, but you know, there's a notion that it could be used in, in more isolated areas in the north. Um, I mean, the Russians are a bit ahead of us on this. I mean, they have a floating SMR uh, in the Arctic. Um, uh, there, Canada enjoys a real leg up on this, not only because of, the, of our uranium resources, you pointed out, David, in, in northern Saskatchewan, I've been there, Cigar Lake, um, but, but also uh, our regulatory uh, uh, environment really gives us a leg up. People trust Canadians and trust our, our, regulatory, um, uh, our regulatory kind of uh, paradigm. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that's tested. People trust this country and, and trust our industry. Um, so there's a whole lot of potential. It ties in with our critical uh, minerals strategy, which we're fermenting and, and uh, we're working with the Americans on as well. Um, and, but SMRs is a real potential and a really, a really big export potential as well. A great potential for this country. I don't know if James wants to weigh in on it. I'm sure he does. Yeah, no, no, Minister. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and I, you know, I would really say there's three pillars to, to, to this working, David. And the minister mentioned the first, first one. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission as a quasi-judicial independent regulator, I can tell you I've been to the uh, IAEA in Vienna. The, the CNSC is a highly respected international regulator. So, you know, and look, we're very proud of our nuclear industry here in Canada, but we are relatively small to, to compare to the US or China or the UK. But the CNSC punches way above its weight. Mm -hmm. And so it's not only domestic, it's international. And so, mm -hmm. You know, we talk a lot about regulatory certainty as an operator to make investments. That's what we need. So I'd say it's, I agree with the minister. It starts with the CNSC. It also lands with, we're creating a foundation in Canada between New Brunswick and the refurbishments and life extensions at Darlington and Bruce. Mm -hmm. We have a very stable nuclear supply chain. So with that, now you can scale it to other things. And I, I believe the future of nuclear is going to be with three areas. It's going to be the, the foundation we have of our existing assets. I actually still believe in a future for can do, the can do technology and where that can apply. Small modular reactors definitely because we have the manufacturing capability, but we also have to tell the nuclear story a little bit more broadly. And you know, the, the World Energy Council has a really good line. It says we shouldn't idolize or demonize any energy source. And part of the problem we have with this debate is we, we make it sound like this is a bunch of binary choices. Let's be honest with ourselves. Every form of technology has its pros and cons. That's we need right. to kind of put that together the best we can. 
So I, I think the minister hit the nail on the head. Gary, did you have a point? I wasn't sure if I saw your hand up or not. Yeah, my, uh, my speaker was off. Uh, I want to say that uh, the minister referred to the International Energy Agency, uh, and they were recently, uh, Dr. Burrell was recently uh, on BNN and talking about urging the world to, you know, sort of use clean energy planning in, in uh, stimulus packages. But he made a clear point. Canada is a leader in providing energy and a leader in clean energy. He talked about carbon pricing. He talked about CCS. He talked about efficiency. He talked about uh, the, you know, most of our electricity is from non-emitting sources. And so uh, we've got something to build on. We've, in Canada, we've got a great story to tell about all of the above. And I, I really like what James had to say, that we should neither demonize nor idolize any particular source of energy, but we should be looking at all of them and, and Canada can be doing a great job. And this will be an important part of our economic recovery if we get the right kinds of policies put in place to ensure that we continue on this track. It's a really important point, Gary. Uh, I agree with you. The, the, the point is to target the emissions, not the source of the emissions. Right. If you're going to demonize anything, demonize the emissions. And that, once you start at that, and in that place, things become a little clearer. Well, and recognizing that emissions, 80%, even if it's oil, 80% of emissions happen when people use it. It's right. not, you know, so, so any of the efforts, any of the investments in technologies that can address the energy, the affordable and accessible energy that people need around the world, that energy in the use of it by people around the world, we need to figure out how that can be either low or no carbon emissions. Um, and so it's the whole cycle that is critically important in all of this. Now the minister, will, oh, Kurt, Al, I'm going to give you the last word. Okay, sure. I, I, I was just going to say, I, I think when we think about technology, it's, it, it, there's lots of talk about technologies and promising technologies. And I, I kind of think of the oil sands experience. Alberta had a situation where they knew that 80% of the resource couldn't be extracted. So they came up with a SAG-D technology. So you had the technology, but who was going to be the first one to go out there and spend a, a sizable chunk of money um, and risk their company at doing it? So then there was a then there was a, a fiscal package that came along with it to help commercialize it. And over time, those fiscal measures that helped commercialize it as the industry got established were pulled away. And now today you have an industry that's up and running. So. It's technology is important, technology development is important, but there's also that commercial aspect where you put in place a situation where someone's willing to take the risk to, to risk capital, to go out and, and invest that way. And, and I think, you know, things like small modular reactors are going to require some of those types of things. And, and there's other carbon captured storage is one I mentioned, but I think there's a number that are going to require both the technology the innovation to get the technology in place and then get, getting a system in place where someone will take the risk to commercialize it. Now the minister will understand I'm getting indications from the control room that our time has expired. <laughs> so I've, got to, I've got to go to cabinet committee. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'll let you go too. Okay, so it, it, it is four o'clock in, in Ontario. It's two o'clock in, in uh, Calgary and it is 5.30 in St. John's, Newfoundland. Indeed, Indeed it is. Indeed so it at is. this point, I'm afraid I have to call the, the day here and, and thank everybody. I thought we covered the issues very frankly, honestly, from a number of points of view. It's clear that as Canadians, we should be proud of our energy sector, and but we need to invest in it, we need to support it, and we need to find ways to deal with the kind of challenges we're facing in terms of oil and gas, uh, transmission, distribution, and so on and so forth. But thank you, Minister, and thank you all of the members who've been on the panel. Um, I've enjoyed it, and I hope the 400 and some odd people who are listening in have enjoyed yeah. it as well. Indeed. And now over to you, Ian, I think to give the benediction as we head off on our various <laughs> activities. Ian. Wow, uh, David's already thanked everyone. Thank you so much to all of our speakers, to David for your deft coordination and Minister O'Regan for taking the time and sharing your thoughts. Uh, we'll be posting this webinar for those in our audience uh, who want to review it, uh, for those of their friends and colleagues who didn't have a chance to
join us who want to view it. Uh, I do know there were audience questions coming in. Uh, I'm sorry we, we couldn't entertain those, but as you see, we had a very full hour uh, packed with comments and, and indeed more could come, uh, though we're out of time. Thank you for joining us. Please, everyone watching, keep thinking and talking about these issues of critical national importance. That was the point of today. And again, really appreciate our speakers for contributing to and encouraging that. And uh, stay well, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you all.